uh, thanks for coming along everybody um good to see so many faces on the call this week um as usual i'll, I'll share some slides in a moment just to um uh, structure the conversation if you all had a chance to look at the agenda um there are i think there might be a few people on the on the call who haven't been on before or at least some faces i don't recognize um if this is your first of these calls do you want to just uh, introduce yourself, say hello to the rest of the group? Should I go first? Uh, hi, my name is Chris Poynton and uh, ignore the Influence Network thing. That's another company that evidently my Zoom account is uh, connected to. So uh, uh, I'm one of the founders of a company called Racefully. Um, and uh, I've been talking to uh, Nisha Iman about uh, getting Racefully activities um, uh getting racefully activities connected up with um uh, uh open active um, and we were a virtual platform so it's interesting challenge i'll talk about that later but that's me hi hello um nick bailey from makes right here can you hear me yes we can nick cool um, yeah, so we've, um, we're a booking platform and we've got some active integration that's now working with IMIN um, for a pilot with Badminton England. So um, we actually have version 0.3 with some elements of 0.4 actually now coded and working and tested. So I'm just interested in keeping, keeping updated with what's going on with 0.4. That's great. Uh, thanks for coming along. Okay, um, I'm going to uh, share my screen. Okay. Um, so the the agenda for this week's call, um, there are a few things to, to cover. Um, we're going to focus primarily on the, the booking specification review, um, but there were a couple of other items uh, that are on the agenda as well. Um, so uh, Chris um, asked if we could have uh, opportunity just to talk a little bit about virtual activities to the group. Um, I think this is likely to end up being a kind of proposal um, for extension to the specification, so it might be just It'd be good to have uh, just an initial conversation about um, what those are, um, what some of the requirements might be. Uh, then we'll focus on the, the booking uh, specification overview. So Nick's going to take us through a discussion there. Um, and then I just at the end, I just very briefly wanted to touch on a document I shared with the group earlier about um, improving some of the processes around um, proposing changes to the specifications and then getting those through to publication. Um, and again, if there's anybody, if there's anything that anyone else wants to cover, then um, uh, please shout. Um, so I'm going to uh, kick things off with the, the discussion around um, virtual activities. Um, Chris, did you want to kind of give us a bit of a, a bit, give some background, a bit of an overview about the things that you've been talking to about Nish and, and your work? Yeah, sure. So, you know, the, the core of, uh, of what I see Open Active having at the moment in its data set is about uh, either it's it's basically it's geolocated and it's it's at a f fixed point in time. So it's like what a, what what can I book with this um, what activities are going on in this particular area at this time of this type? And there's a lot of discovery around that. And um, I was scratching my head and talking to Nish about how um, things like um, a week-long virtual promotion where someone was saying run run a marathon at some point this week and get a medal um, or um, in the race fleet case you can also run live with people remotely so the location doesn't matter but the time might matter you could say um, okay if there's nothing no one to go for a run with um, at 6 p.m in hackney well a, another option would be do a virtual run with someone anywhere in the world at 6 p.m and here are the people that have flagged that they want to uh, that they're available to run with you or they're looking for people to run with if you want to join them and that would then sort of potentially get down into uh, sort of capabilities and uh, how fast the run's going to be and how far it's going to be and all that sort of good stuff um, and so i'm interested to see if we can uh, to, to, to learn a bit more about how uh, open active might be extended to support this idea of either a locationless activity or potentially a not a specific time but a time period based activity and um, 
you know happy to get involved i'm not i'm not saying it needs fixing i'm just interested to see how we can support some of these virtual modes for for people, getting people out and active it feels like something that would be a good direction to go in in the long term great okay is, is that something that anyone else has has looked at or thought about um hi it's uh dave from emd uk can you hear me Brilliant. Um, yeah, actually, we've, we've, we've had the same conversation, and um, I can see Nick Evans nodding with Nick um, for a couple of weeks ago. Um, we've put, um, we, National Health Body for Group Exercise, so um, we're just developing a new search at the moment, which will include um, online classes. Um, so the user will, will could, could search for an actual class or search for a sort of a virtual class that doesn't have a set location um, and we, ha we had this conversation and I believe and Nick will correct me if I'm wrong um, that we're I, I, that we're using a, a type of broadcast event as a, as a standard reference and um, I think that was something that Nick found was already in place you might want to jump in at this point <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, uh, broadcast event is a schema.org type, um, and uh, that we we talking to Jade about what to, how to represent that um, information. Um, it's, it's online classes, Jade, isn't it? You mainly that's the kind of thing. Yeah, that's it. So someone's in a studio somewhere doing a a class, or someone's recorded a class, and and someone wants to just sort of do it via their computer. So it, I don't know if it's it's so it, we're using well at the, at the moment the plan at least with is, is to use the scheme dog broadcast event for that which wouldn't require any spec changes because that's just using schema although um, may require an addition to the profile open active profile which is a, I guess a separate conversation but um, does um, I don't know if that's quite the same though as what you were talking about in terms of. Um, because it's a, it's a, it's an online event with you kind of expect a TV screen to be the, and you're kind of in a space watching it so hence broadcast event makes sense um, so uh, are you thinking um, I mean it, it sounds like this isn't a broadcast event this is more of a kind of uh, I don't know virtual event or something uh, I guess there's there's two <coughs> two parts that um and I, I wasn't sure, uh, in, in fact, whether Jade was specifically talking about a broadcast event, meaning it's a group event, but it's at a particular fixed, you know, there are places to participate in it. So if you think of a, um, you know, a, a, a ride on a, a spin class or something like that would be a, a group event, even if it, if it was a virtual class being taught. So that, that's sort of, sort of um, there's, there's whether it's happening at a particular fixed time, but where you how you participate doesn't where you are to participate doesn't matter. So there's a there's a race on Zwift, and if I've got a power meter at home and and I um, I'm on Zwift, I can join the race, and it where it is doesn't matter, but it uh, that when it is obviously does matter. And that sounds yeah, really good, sorry, like one case of that. Oh, sorry, I was just going to say I think the concept I think we're talking about the same thing. Um, so it, it, we, we haven't actually differentiated between the two. Um, it could be an event that's happening somewhere that you could go to, um, but the, the user in this case wouldn't be going there, or it could be something that you couldn't go to, as you said, like just like, like Swift. Um, it's, it's just out there in the ether and you want to join in. Yes, I think the, the, the second mode, if you like, is the self-serve mode where, um, hey, there isn't a gym class near you, but through service X, you can grab a class and do it on your TV. Or in, yes. in, the, in the racefully sense, there isn't a run near you, but hey, here's, here's, um, here's, here's one that Tech Runners did last week. You can grab it and just uh, run along with it. So you're kind of, you're self-serving. And, and in that case, um, it's, it can be both location and time independent. I, I guess I've got, I found a third one while I was talking, which is this idea that uh, there is a kind of 
events going on over a period of time that you can participate in virtually. And that's more like the virtual race, this kind of idea where, uh, you know, do, do a 10K, the, this, you know, do the, I don't know what it would be, the, the uh, Easter 10K and everybody gets an, an Easter egg medal if they do a 10K this month. And that's, that's kind of, that reminds me a bit if, if you're on time out, you know, you're, you're looking at what's on in London. Uh, there are some things that are just on every single day, you know, it's mousetrap or whatever it is. There's, there's always one every day that you could do it for the period of time that that show runs. And that kind of idea was what I had in my mind potentially for that kind of a, a time period based approach. Hmm. Does sound different to broadcast event um, in terms of the the semantic meaning. So maybe there's a either well maybe we broke it we break it into two one for broadcast event where it's there's a TV and you go and sit in front of it and do do your thing um, uh, or you're on online or and then there's the one where you literally leave the house and you're racing someone virtual or you're participating in something um, with a route or something. I don't know. So. Um, what I'd like to do, I think, is to move this forward in, as a, a separate proposal and, and kind of get, gather together some of this discussion that we can um, document as an issue and then work out the detail of what might need to be changed in the specification, whether there's some things that we're using existing things like broadcast event would do or whether there's other things that we need to put into the spec. So, um, Chris and Jade, if I follow up with the two of you to start to put some detail around that that and that we can share with the wider group does that sound all right sure yeah that sounds great and there's probably a couple of other uh, companies not on this call that might be interested in participating um so i'll uh, i'll see if i can rustle them up to to get involved yeah that's great okay fantastic um i'd like you know i'd like to use these calls to surface this kind of uh, discussion and um new areas where we need to be doing some more spec work. And I'm going to kind of touch on that a little bit at the end of the call, because it relates to some of the, um, the governance and process documentation that I circulated earlier. Um, but for the purposes of kind of public, I'm trying to cover everything in the agenda, I'm going to move us on to the next, um, next section and um, discussion around where we're at with um, the booking work. Um, so I'm going to just go back to sharing these slides in case. Nick wants to use them. Um, so, uh, the, Nick, do you want to do you want to pick up here? Yeah, sure. Um, so I might. I don't know. Can we both share screens? Does that happen? Or uh, oh, well, let me talk through this first, and then we can we can swap um, screens. So, um, for for it, I, I think most people may well or, or may have seen a bit of this, but just to make sure that everyone's got the we're on the same page. Um, this is the content. This is the list of content we've kind of generated to date relating to booking. Um, we started off with a workshop. Um, a few of you guys came to that um, and we wrote some use cases and requirements off the back of that workshop. Um, we, um, in parallel to the workshop, created a best practices document as a kind of basis for how, you know, RESTful best practices we'd be using to, for the API and, and how that would work. Um, and we then threw together a very quick 0.3 um, to facilitate people to uh, quickly implement and uh, start to actually do bookings which is what Nick was talking about earlier um, so that's happening and there's I believe a live with two is that right Siv and Nick is there two at the moment live with 0.3 uh, definitely good Jim um, and uh, yeah de definitely good Jim I don't know about anyone else oh of course, of course Gladstone's an internal um, yeah okay sure so um, sounds like good, Jim, and then and, and then Nick and um, uh, Mix and our parks are on the journey towards that. So um, I know that our parks are holding off a little bit um, in anticipation of 0.4 to save themselves some time um, and uh, do that all at once. And uh, and so there's uh, there's the, yeah. So there we've got 0.3 and 0.4, and 0.4 is actually in Swagger as well, which means that we can use a different interface to look through those um, documents. So um, that's what we've got. What will be quite good to do now in the time we have is just um, quickly run through a, a diagram, a flow diagram of, of how this all works um, and then link it back to the actual Swagger documentation and show you, show you that as well. So um, this is the flow. It's actually 
quite simple, although this diagram is comprehensive. So, um, uh, but this would kind of show you what you what you go through to do to make a booking, and then I can point at the, the, the swagger um, endpoints in a sec to kind of match this. Um, basically, the idea is that you um, there's this feed of data coming through, and you pick a session out that you want to book. That's what the first thing and the second thing are talking about. Um, so there's a there's a an item displayed somewhere uh, on our web page, and then when the consumer chooses that to book. The session uh, is then um, there's an there's an offer in that session that's being selected. So that's you know I'm an adult or I'm a junior. Um, if you choose an adult, then um, that's the point at which we first engage properly with the booking API. First thing that happens is we check the availability to make sure that there are indeed still spaces. Um, I'll show you the call for that in a sec. Um, and then when we've done that, you can see there's a little is there available place? Yes, no. Um, the next thing that we do is we go through to um, uh, lease a spot. So that, that means just reserve some a spot for a period of time. 120 seconds, I think, is the amount of time that's in the spec at the moment. It's not designed for interactive shopping basket. It's just a one-off. It's a lease. Sorry, it's a lease just for that duration so that you can process payment. Um, you then, um, assuming that the um, you then you then take the payment and um, notify the customer that the payment has um, gone through successfully. Um, so I, probably easier to show that in the, with the endpoints. Um, and, uh, and then I can, uh, yeah, get, get into that as well. Um, Do you so want this to show is a, this? Yeah, yeah, so, so this yeah. diagram is good to um, just show that. Um, uh, and, uh, and then we can talk about the endpoint. So at the moment, the way it works is that you would, the first thing you would do is you would get the session, get, get session um, is that check of availability that gives you back the number of offers. Um, and if you pick one of those offers to go through a junior adult, or whatever it is, um, you then send saying, I, I want this session with this offer. So I want, I want to go to that thing at 7 PM and I'm an adult. Um, and then it will then uh, say it, uh, it has if you if you post saying that you want to lease that um, it's called creating a new order. If you post to say create a new order, then when you um, get a response back saying yes, here's the location, that means the order has been created. Um, you then have to do a separate. This is a new thing in 0.4. You have to do a, a get on the order at this point if you want to log the status of the order or any detail about it. Um, so there's a there's a gap there where you might choose to do a get um, because you're just getting a 201 location header back um, and we, we can talk about that and there's an issue um, around that potentially um, but just creating an extra call and then uh, and then there's an, another post which you do after you've made the payment so you make the payment um, so that, that's out of band so strike or whatever happens and then when that's done you say great I've made the payment um, 10 pounds of which two pounds went to, you know, the broker, the intermediary. Um, and that's, uh, and you, you, you post that and say payment made and the payments made, you get this two one created. Um, and, uh, although it's not shown on this diagram, that two one created again has a location header with the order in it. You have to do a further get to get that confirmation number, which is at the end. Um, and, uh, so yeah, and I think there's a, um, although this is correct restfully in terms of it forces you to do that, the extra gets, it does increase the number of calls necessary to make the booking by um, double because instead of two calls, you have to do four. And so there's, I suppose there's a, there's a question there. Um, but uh, that's something that we should, uh, um, yeah, we can, we can talk about as I said in a sec. Uh, question from Nick Bailey. Uh, Ability to directly create an order without a reservation stage. Do you want me to, so I didn't want to jump in, so I thought I'd just message you. Um, yeah, that's right, go for it. Yeah, so um, we've got use cases where the aggregator has the authority to create an order. Basically, they can do what they want with a, with a session. Um, so you've got a use case where you've got a free booking that can be created immediately. But I suppose I'm asking for a, a flag or, or something within the original order creation which is basically just create the order um don't even necessarily know how much the aggregator is paying for that session is this for the free use case no for a paid use case 
Um, so, um, so it might be that we are the booking system, but that the aggregator actually owns the relationship with the customer. So we don't know how much they're being paid for that session, but we know that there's a paid, essentially a paid place being booked. With you. So, so basically, sense? is it useful to send? You don't need to necessarily send, create an invoice or, um, or any notion of payment. You're just literally reserving a slot. Yeah, and also, well, you're, you're creating an active reservation that won't expire, it, but in one call. So okay. it's, it, it, it's exactly the same as the free use case, except being able to force a paid use case to do the same thing. Mm. Okay, good, good to know. That's something we should, we, we should add into the um, um, list of future requirements, this spec or the next one. Um, sounds like that's a bit of a, so, so um, yeah, so to cover the free use case, I guess, as, as part of that, the, the way that the, 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 there's currently an issue, which I'll share my screen and show you in a sec, which is open around how we handle free use case. Um, there's a few different options for that. In fact, are you, is the next, what's your next slide, Lee? Is it better for me to just go ahead and share that now? So I don't uh, want to jump in and yeah, then take you out of sequence. I, was, I haven't got slides. I was going to jump over to the, um, the Swagger Docs. Ah, perfect. Yeah, let me show you. Can I just jump, jump in and share my screen on top? Is that yeah, right? sure. Cool. So. Oops. It's just something we're actually seeing because we're working on a couple of APIs at the moment. Um, and certainly at least one of them doesn't have a reservation stage. It just goes straight through to the booking. So the um, the free payment is a is an open issue, and we'll kind of flag this afterwards. But but the, there's a question here about um, to exactly Nick's point, um, where uh, there's a, um, a currently a, a need to put in the total paid to provider and the total paid to customer. Uh, and I guess what Nick's saying here is that actually that's not necessarily always required in order to complete the payment in the free case, as well as in some cases where you don't need to put that in. Um, I mean, I presume it could just be ignored if it was sent, but um, it's not necessary. And so there's a few options here, and please do comment. I know Siv's already had a comment on this, um, as to how we um, potentially can represent the simple version of this. Everything from just including zero, um, if it doesn't need to be there, to um, just not including anything. So you could just post a payment to say, I'm confirming this order, um, although that's not very clear what's happening. Um, and so, yeah, so there's something in there. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's probably a good time to switch over to this and just point at some of this uh, swagger. Does that help, Nick? Um, yeah, so it might be, and I don't, again, I'm maybe slightly solutioning here, but that you can create, a, you can add a payment object with the original order. Add a payment object with the original order. Right, so, so, your, so avoiding the lease order. completely. Yeah, don't know if that makes logical sense. Sure, sure. So yeah, I that's guess how, that's, that's kind of how our structure works. You, you have um, an event linked to a pass and the pass is linked to a payment. So essentially, yeah, just creating that stack of three in one go. Yeah, sure. Um, so it, it, it's really going to be a question of whether this flow that we just talked about is going to be um, the same for every use case or whether we want to allow a deviation to the flow. Um, so if we force two calls, then it's always going to be the same, at least book, even if it's immediately after each other, or we can allow some variation. I guess there's a pros and cons about how complicated we want to make the implementation. Well, we, I mean, we might just support our own enhancement, which is... Um which allows you to drop the payment in. It's just I'd rather bring these things up now. No, no, definitely, definitely, absolutely. It's good to, yeah, good to think about that. It'd be good to hear if um, people will be interested in implementing, yeah, one versus the other. Um, okay, so that's so that's that. Um, and uh, kind of looking through some of this, um, basically the the way it works is there's a there's a get endpoint that gives you the session ID. Um, you, when you get your session, that's getting you the latest version, including the offers and all the detail in there. Um, when you get that, uh, you then can make that the post to orders we just discussed there. Um, and that gives you the, 
you accept it off at the order item, etc. Um, when it, it's then created, you can then get an order. You want to then um, follow the get here to, to log anything that you want to about the status of it or what it's come back with in terms of the amount, the price. Um, and then uh, post to payments to complete the order that we just mentioned there. So the final post, which is quite simply. So I've got another question around the payments. Um, do, do shut them up if I'm, if I'm being <laughs> going over the top. Um, the, it's not explicit in the spec whether or not, um, whether a single payment completes the reservation. Mm -hmm. There's no rule in that, in the spec that I can see. Uh, you, yes. By introducing payment, payment one to many payment, uh, potentially you could have, you know, what, what is necessary to complete an order? Don't know. Good challenge. Um, and we were also having this conversation around, um, yeah, should we have a completion endpoint, but that's quite RPC, or is there a restful way of actually saying, yeah, we've registered all the payments now, we have this order and we're going to complete it? Um, I mean, we've certainly, with, if we've just said the first payment that comes in, we'll, we'll, um, we'll commit the order. Right. Yeah. So there's a little bit of a consideration around that as well. Definitely good to know. Um, and then I thought the other thing that might be worth um, highlighting here, so that's the, there are the steps. Um, they're just a few of the, of the kind of principles of the way that this is constructed, just to check your, your feedback on this as well. Um, and so this is a list of um, different things that we're kind of suggesting as part of this, um, the way that the responses are constructed. So there's a few, um, and feel free to jump in with thoughts as we as just run through these quickly. So the first is that all that we use IDs as URIs all the way through. Um, that's helpful because it means that you can um, uh, more easily identify exactly what that URI is, is referring to instead of just having an ID on its own, um, making it clear that 9209 is actually a session rather than it could be a leader or it could be a, anything um, within the context. And you can, of course, get any of those things at any time when you're debugging or working through the code. So um, there's that. And, uh, and as, as mentioned here, when you reference something then when you're passing it in, you then use that same ID to say, yeah, we're going to use that. Um, we want to use that particular session. There's two, using 201s. Two um, so using 201s is, as I mentioned, it does increase the number of calls that you make, but arguably it's more restful. Um, so uh, when you make a post, you don't get anything back from that. You have to make a further call to get whatever it is that's been created if you want to check the status of it. Um, I suggested adopting the uh, JSON API pagination for anything that doesn't need, needs pagination, but doesn't need um, kind of RPD real-time pagination, just for standard kind of paging, and um, such as search results. And JSON API has got a pattern for this, which is the next and last uh, and uh, self pages as links, and then the data within a data block like this. Um, also in the same way for anyone that's returning uh, data as an, as an array, rather than just returning the raw array, including a data um, property that then includes the array, which then allows you to extend later if you want to uh, around the data property. Um, a couple other things, making sure that we use types in both the responses and the requests to ensure that we have this kind of extensibility in the future if we want to add additional types also makes everything validate with schema.org, which is handy for validation tools. Um, means we can switch on types and things like that. Um, making sure that we use schema.org for properties if we're doing search, so slash sessions, uh, query gender restriction equals male rather than just gender equals male, which just is more expressly schema. Um, uh, time zone is quite a niche, niche one, but using time zone, um, uh, suggesting to actually include the time zone if there is one with the in the start date rather than including that as a separate property, um, just because it allows you to render the, the, that actual um, event in local time if you want to or in UTC if you want to. Um, 
and then there's this this action block which is basically a way of saying um, um and i think it might be included in the swagger as well so let me show you in situ to make this make more sense in the action block if you're getting a session and there's a and you can book that session um there's now this uh where is it potential action here this reserve action that allows you to book uh so that's that's specified like that so you can you can go ahead and use that um so yeah so something about making sure that you can yeah you, you know what endpoints to go to next um uh yeah, we're using reservation, an event reservation as a schema type to represent the actual thing that's booking, that's, sorry, the reservation that's being created by the booking, if we need to represent that separately. Um, for example, the order might contain a number of reservations, and so this allows you to include, I mean, look at that in more detail um, at another point. And um, yeah, finally, making sure that we consistently use the schema or customer um, concept. So representing the customer using the schema terms. Um, so there's some there's some um, kind of thoughts on principles there for and and I'd be interested to hear if anyone's got any thoughts on on those if that or they all sound reasonable if you found those to be in your implementations um, reasonable as well. Yeah, Nick, Nick here again. Um, we've. We've done some stuff with um, non-UK clubs and, and UTC is something we wish we'd thought about when we built the platform in the first place because we've had to rebuild the whole bloody thing. <laughs> um, so yeah, go for UTC and as, as, as you've put it, so that you can just strip out the time zone, display it in local, in local time for that provider. Um, but I would have a clear strategy. I mean, it, I th <sighs> we've come to the conclusion that you need to display times in the local in the club's local time zone mm -hmm. um, so if you're in france you actually want to see the time in the in uk time even if your location isn't in the uk because actually that's the, the location is linked to the time of that event um yes but then you want to order events by the utc which mm -hmm. again makes uh, so there's a there's a lot to think about with utc if you're running uh, international events on the same listing so um yeah not to go into this too much but um just it's a really good point um so i do remember a colleague of mine that works at cisco um likes storing dates in utc because you can order by utc if we do if we going with the strategy here means we can't easily order by the content of this field we'll have to have a separate field so i suppose there is an argument for splitting out time zone as a separate field so that we can do an order by on this field um, and the, the kind of trade-off and complexity here was if you put the time zone as a separate field, not a, some libraries don't let you easily do that, um, kind of combine time zone as a separate field and um, a UTC timestamp. Um, well, we record everything in our back end in UTC. All of the clubs have to choose their own time zone. Um, right. we do, um, the front end is responsible for, for rendering. Uh, it's just a pain, frankly, but yeah. Do you do you store time zones separately as a separate field? To the field? Uh, yeah, the clubs own the time own their own time zone, so they can change the time zone. Yeah, so that's the other thing that can happen, isn't it? Because if the club changes the time zone, the original storage of the thing shouldn't change. Um, exactly. Yeah. You don't yeah. really want local dates sitting in your central database. Mm, that is interesting. So there's the other a, there's complexity is um, <laughs> this is where it gets this is where it gets interesting. Um, we've got peak and off peak times for uh, badminton, which where we're having to store the local time zone, the local time in the central database because actually um, peak and off peak doesn't make sense in UTC. Mm. Because eight o'clock in the morning is eight o'clock in the morning in the local time zone. There's no point storing it as seven o'clock for some of the year. Yes. Uh, with you okay so in that case you were saying in that case it's better to store it in local time yeah in in, in I, I don't know what you would, uh, moment has a word for it moment js but yeah it's the sort of untime zoned it's just yeah local time zone what you would see on your watch yeah yeah right um but it's, uh, okay. this is more of this is less 
the spec problem. It's more of a sort of clear implementation problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, because it feels like we could we understand what people want to do in terms of indexing and storage locally versus what we want people to interchange and mm. encouraging a consistent practice. Even if it was just making sure that there's a time zone qualifier, if we don't go as far as saying everything is in UTC, it would be like, I think clearer. Okay. Uh, what's, the, what's the disadvantage of giving both? I've seen APIs where they give you a UTC time and a local time. Um, no reason why we can't do that. Uh, allow for both. Um, May actually be the best solution, to be honest. Instead of the time zone included, or as what? Well, so you have this. Uh, no, start date, start date UCT, uh, UTC, and then start date um, local with time zone or something. The only thing is that it bloats the API slightly is the potential risk there. So just in terms of, would that mean that, for example, um, uh, yeah, we would have to have start date, end date in every occurrence doubled. Um, yeah, yeah, potentially. There's another um, another issue that, again, we've 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 kind of learnt at our cost. Um, the when you're doing filtering with your opportunity endpoint, if you pass in dates, you're assuming a time zone, or you're actually restrict you're you're restricting um, what you actually get back. So, input queries need to be in a time zone or in UTC as well. Ideally, UTC. So it's up to the client to. The client for the um, API to to convert to UTC and then ask you for the range within those UTC start and end dates times. wasn't quite sorry. I wasn't quite following that. So um, with the session, the session query, you can do a start date and an end date, or is that UTC? That's right. You can. Um, but of course, a date one person's date is not the same as another person's date when it comes to actual time of session. Right, yes. So that should actually be in UTC as a time. So the start date and the end date query uh, of the session's endpoint, you're saying, should be... Yeah, that, uh, basically, should, you shouldn't have queries in dates because that doesn't actually make any sense. Oh, the date without the time, that's what you're saying. You want to be able to render the start date, the start day of the first day and the end, the start time of the first day and the end time of the second day in yep. the local time zone. Yeah, really good point. Okay, so we uh, we can we've moved away from using dates for queries. Mm, mm, mm. Really good. I um, mean, this might be me being esoteric, but actually, it, it's a genuine thing when you start trying to implement this. Sure. Um, okay. Anyone apart from time zones? Have we got any other um, quick comments across the other? Back, bit, back from that rabbit hole. I know. Love love the time zones. Just uh, across any of the <laughs> other other things. And particularly any general issues about the, the, the kind of flow or the kind of high level design or is, or is everyone broadly happy with that and we do just need to now focus on some of these more detailed questions. Uh, I was going to ask where I could find the uh, previous page we were looking at um, which showed the flow of the APIs. Uh -huh. The, the diagrams. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So that's in the um, the booking the, the 0 0.4 version of the booking um, standard. I uh, emailed that to the list earlier. Okay. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, so uh, I've been, we've been including the links to some of these documentation in the slides, which I've been circulating after the calls. But what yeah. I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, post the links to the community group blog so that they're a bit more readily available for everyone. So there's a kind of reference point. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Otherwise, it looks good to me. Um, Sid, did you want to um, talk about the the four uh, the, the four versus the two calls? Because I know we were talking about that the other day. Yeah, I was, I was going to bring that up. It was um, so we having implemented or well, having started to implement point four, we found that we're doing uh, five calls instead of three. I think. Because uh, we're having to get order details every, uh, every time we do a post. Um, I was just wondering what other other people thought about 
the the increased network traffic and that sort of thing when before when you did a post you got the order details back in the body and it just feels like okay it might not be the most resty solution but um saving saving everyone doing extra calls and adding that slight delay for everything else and complexity in code and whatnot Um, well, I, one thing I would say is that, that that pattern, the kind of 201 created, follow the link, is a fairly standard RESTful pattern. So it's not like we're doing something particularly unusual. Um, so, I mean, maybe I'm missing something, but you would only have to do that sort of get request if there was a, if you were expecting that there were additional information in that response that you don't already have on the client. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I think most of the gets that we do, we do for logging purposes, just check the, the status of the order and um, something like that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. It felt like a bit of extra work, but I, I agree that it does seem more resty, uh, more, more of a standard pattern. Um, yeah, I guess the other the other element was the confirmation code, which uh, yeah you have to you have to get at the end um, yeah. when you, from the final order after the payments occurred. Um, yeah, so I, I I don't I don't really have a take on this other than um, I know that there's a bit of a, a slight kind of conflict between um, restful correctness and efficiency, which is why Google created G gRPC in for for all of their traffic. Um, because they obviously prefer efficiency. I suppose because we've gone with RESTful as our kind of philosophy, maybe we are making the decision here to, and it's probably just quite important to flag that's the decision we're making, to um, opt for correctness and, and in the design over potential network efficiency. Um, because obviously doubling the number of calls in every for every booking across systems uh, has a effect on... Um, well, the whole the whole ecosystem's traffic overall. Um, but if we're consciously doing that because of the, the design decisions we're making, I guess that's uh, that's just something to flag, and, and then we can um, be aware that we made this point here when someone else says, "Why are we making four or five calls?" Yeah, I, I think if we're choosing a particular style of design, then we should be consistent with that. Um, if there are like if there are implementation issues if it turns out in practice that it's not workable then then we can revise um, because otherwise if we we're going to optimizing to minimize network traffic we'd probably make a whole bunch of different decisions you know we might just have one or two post endpoints go with a binary format rather than the JSON you know and, and kind of optimize mm. for that um, mm -hmm. there's well, yeah. Where some of these, issues, I mean, I'm not trying to override anything. I'm just, I'm just suggesting some kind of ways forward. Um, where this was flagged before in, a, in something in another context, but there's other other guidance that we've been putting in place to help reduce kind of um, overhead and network traffic. You know, encouraging uh, GZIP and compression of responses to minimise what's been sent over the wire. Um, one thing specifically around the the two one created pattern that um, in the response it is possible to return an e tag so that the the request any subsequent get request to the resource can be a conditional request so there might actually not be a response so there's still a HTTP request but it might just end up with a kind of no content if that makes sense how would that work for the first order because you don't have the you don't have the order yet. Or are you thinking for the second order? Uh, so when when you get back, so in a, in a in a two hundred one created response, so we can include the location header. Alongside that location header, you can give an e tag for the current version of the resource that's been referenced, just been created. 
so that, that immediately when you do a get request on that resource, you can include that e-tag as a conditional request. So you might end up then not having, you know, might not have to actually serialize or repass a response. You wouldn't have the first order to, I mean, you'd, you'd still have to get the first order in order to know that you wouldn't need to get it again, right? Otherwise, you wouldn't have, I don't see, so you, were, you would be logging the thing what would you yeah what, what response would you log because you wouldn't have it if you used an e-tag and conditional get didn't return anything we could we could take sorry if that's the, if this is a derailing question um yeah so there might be a thing about conditional responses to be um discussed and explained um just in terms of time because i'm aware of not much time left i think nick bailey this um, I know you were talking earlier about um, maybe we should have a pattern where you only make one request to um, make a booking rather than two requests um, where, you know, for the payment. So maybe there's just a one-off reserve request. I feel like if we're going to adopt the principle that we want, you know, we want consistency over network traffic, then that might answer that one as well. So i.e. it's better to have two requests always, even though that's additional traffic, because we'd rather consistency. Um, over um, over traffic. I don't, I'm just kind of just testing the, the thinking here. Yeah, I, um, I think that I think one's a use case, one's a kind of customer use case, whereas one's and the other one's more about network hygiene. I think they've got two different drivers. Uh, I, I don't, the only reason I'm keen for a single request is I think that's what essentially our customers are asking for on other APIs. Um, yeah, so I don't have anything to say about the 201 issue really because that's that's up to people who are more resty. <laughs> okay. Um, do you want to um, crack on Lee with the, um, the last bit? Um, yeah, just very briefly. Um, so just to maybe just wrap up that, that bit. Um, so we, we're doing some more work on the 0 0.4 spec. The intention is to move out some of these issues and discussion points into GitHub issues so that we can, it's easier to kind of comment on and keep a kind of history around um, what decisions we're making. Um, uh, just to kind of open up that kind of discussion. Um, and then also start to move the that Google document into a kind of more uh, public specification, similar to what we've been doing with the rest um, rest of the outputs. Um, so just in the last last few minutes, <clears throat> um, so over the last um, I think couple of months, we've had quite a, a few new people um, join the community group, um, just start to kind of get involved with uh, what we've been doing. Um, so I was aware that we could probably needed to put some work in to bring people up speed on the kind of ways that we have been kind of collaborating in the past. Um, there's a number of discussions happening around uh, potential revisions to the spec, whether it's things like virtual activities, um, uh, amenities that we discussed on the last call, as well as the kind of ongoing discussion around facilities. Um, so we just need to kind of perhaps clarify what some of the processes around how those proposals get raised in the community and then how they end up um, with leading through to um, changes to the specifications. Um, so to help address some of that, I've put together a document that puts up just a bit of context to how we work as a group, what the kind of guiding principles are around us trying to work in the open and kind of collaborate to create openly licensed specifications. Um, and in that document, it also spells out um, a, a, the process for raising uh, new proposals for changes to the specifications. So um, the, what I'm suggesting uh, to Chris and Jade earlier is that I work with them to get a proposal together around virtual activities and I'd like to get some of the other things that we've been discussing um, over the past few calls uh, documented as proposals so we can start to work them into the, into the specifications. Um, the doc also kind of um, uh, spells out a kind of a, a bit more of a release process, a bit more of a rhythm for um, pushing forward on the specifications. So trying to get into a, a practice of doing more ed regular editor's drafts for people to comment on. 
um, and aim to do uh, uh, point releases of the core specifications every two months. So we'll aim to do a 1.1 um, release of the opportunity model and the paging specs at the end of April and then 1.2 at the end of June for example. Um, we're going to be a little way from getting booking to a kind of 1.0 release but we'll try and keep um, that moving forward at on a regular pace as well. Then on a kind of annual basis we'll do major releases so look at doing 2.0 of say the, the data model um, uh, sort of after, after 12 months, 12 months from its first release. Um, and the idea there is that we've got, as I say, a regular rhythm, but um, it allows um, us to kind of move forward at pace where we've got new requirements, but also for anyone that's kind of slow moving, then they can choose to start to adopt um, kind of stable, um, well-versioned um, uh, editions of the, of the various specs. So all of this is kind of outlined in the document I shared on the mailing list earlier. Um, it's open for comment. If anyone's got any feedback on it, then uh, please either let me know or leave a comment on the doc. Uh, otherwise, we're just going to start to kind of um, adopt that going forward. Um, I don't think there's anything hugely different to the way that we've been working. It's just merely just kind of documenting the kind of in more, slightly more informal processes we've been following. But we've, we've got to the kind of size now and uh, size of the group and the number of kind of parallel things we're doing that we kind of needed that reference point. So, so, so that was it. Um, anyone got any questions about that? I, I doubt anyone's had time to look through the doc yet, but um, if you do, then, uh, then let me know. Um, we've got a, a couple of minutes left. Is there anything that anyone else wanted to raise today? Okay. Um, if not, then um, we'll kind of we'll wrap up the call. Uh, our next one is on the 25th of April. Um, the plan there is to um, address any, uh, have a discussion, address any final comments on what will be the 1.1 version of the specifications that will get published at the end of the month, um, and probably a more another review of some of the issues around the, the booking specification. For for Jade's benefit, because I know that she wanted to ask this, but she's dropped off, um, uh, probably because we were talking tech for a while, um, is uh, if she wants to get special requirements into 1.1, um, what's the best way of doing that? Um, so uh, as long as we just need to uh, make sure that there's a proposal that's getting the issue, um, circulate that to the group so that everyone's aware of it and they'll have to give everybody a chance to... Um, provide some comment on it mm -hmm. um, if it's you know if it's a well well de defined proposal you know there's a clear uh, need for, around it and we can get you know uh, some thumbs up from two or three people across the community then I don't see any reason why that can't go into 1.1 uh, great okay Right, okay, um, thanks everybody then. Then we'll uh, wrap up the call. As always, uh, it's great, for you, great that you will give up some of your time to kind of move this discussion forward. Um, it's really helpful in making sure that we've got some good quality outputs. Um, and please do take time to look through some of the documentation that we've um, shared and uh, chip in with your um, feedback and thoughts. Right, uh, thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Cheers.